Mr. Stauk, if you'd raise your right hand, please, sir. Do you swear or affirm the testimony about to give this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. Go ahead and have a seat in the witness stand. Please watch your step as you step into the stand. Mr. Allen? Thank you, Robert. Now, will you please introduce yourself to this jury and spell your name for the record? Um, Al Stauk, and that's S-T-A-U-C-H, and Gannon's father. <laughs> Al, I want to uh, start by talking a little bit about you. You may. People's exhibit number. What is people's exhibit number one? That's my boy. Can <laughs> yes, I yes, no. yes. I move for admission of people's exhibit one. Defense. Exhibit number one will be admitted. Go ahead. I would object to it. I can't see it. Okay. We need to take it down, though, if it's all right. I want to have you tell the jury a little bit about your son. How old was he when we lost him? He's 11. How was he born? September 29th, 2008. No, he was uh, four months early. One pound and six ounces. Who is Gannon's mother? Landon uh, Hyatt, oh, I, I think her name's Bullard now, Landon Bullard. Were you married with Landon when Gannon was born? I was, yes. Gannon have a little sister? Yes. Lena. Straight for the jury, how big Gannon was? Or Scott the whole yeah, so as I said, he was born on September 29th, and it was about a month after that. I think it was October 20th. I got to hold him for the first time, and that's how big he was right there. And when, the last time I ever got to hold him, he was in a box about that big as well. Six months after he died. in the hospital for a short amount of time after that. Yeah, I believe we brought him home in January. If I remember correctly, the, towards the end of January or sometime in January of um, 2009. So about three, three and a half months in the hospital. Did he have any uh, issues that he had to overcome? Did you have any premature uh, yeah, early on he had um, a lot of lung issues. Actually, while he was in the hospital, he had quite a number of surgeries, um, hernia, he had some, like I said, I think he was lung collapse one time, so he had a chest tube, also was on a feeding tube, and a lot of things that go along with being a preemie. Um, after that, he, he did take a while to overcome his lung issues. He had pneumonia and RSV, I think at the same time, at one point. A um, couple, of, I mean, the, the only long-lasting, well, two long-lasting things he had from it, he just had some stomach issues where he had trouble going to the bathroom, and then um, he did have ADHD. Was he, uh, did he sort of lag in size to kids similarly aged? Uh, not really. I mean, other than at his birth, obviously, he was very, very small, one pound, six ounces. Um, but once he caught up, I think we held him back a grade or a, a year just to allow that and him to catch up a little bit in size. But, no, you couldn't tell any difference with his, the fifth graders the, the year he died. So Where was he born? What state? Uh, South Carolina, Florence, South Carolina. When did you all move to uh, I moved. I moved to Colorado in uh, February of 2019. Um, my Tisha and the kids had come a month earlier. I, I was stationed in Alaska prior to that. So, what did Gannon like to do for 
Oh, some of his favorite times, and all of his friends can attest to this, is just playing video games. Um, I think he, he wanted to be a YouTube uh, gamer. I think he actually was able to make one video and put it on YouTube, so it's out there, but playing Sonic, and uh, actually Mario was his favorite, so um, that was some of the favorite things I ever got to do with him, so. Up on your witness stand, mm -hmm. um, you should also have a reminder there next year. Yes, sir. It's going to get a little crowded up there. The slot camera there, standing in front of me. It's going to be there too. Open it up. Should be the first exhibit. Yes. What is people's exhibit? Excuse me. That's a picture of Lena. Uh, yes, sir. That would have been probably 2018 at our house in Myrtle Beach. Defense. Uh, exhibit number two will be admitted. Uh, all right. Uh, like I said, we owned a house in Myrtle Beach at that time, and I believe that would have been the fall of 2018. So how old was Lena? Um, 2012, so six and a half. Yeah. Right, thanks. Yeah, about six and a half years old. Was, was she also born early? She was. Uh, she actually tried to come out a little earlier than Gannon. They were you know, always a competitive with one another, but... Uh, Gannon was born at 24 weeks. She tried to come out at 22. Um, but I think it was actually 34 weeks of, you know, being with her mom and her tummy there before she came out. So she was about two months early. What was the relationship like between you? Oh, I, obviously, as much love as a sister and brother can have, I, I think one of the, <coughs> I think a famous quote Lena said after Gannon died was, I'm just going to miss getting on his nerves. So if that sums it up for you right there. But yeah, he loved his sister. And uh, well, one thing I always urged him to do, and I know his mama did too, was to look after his little sister. And even getting off the bus and walking home, I used to fuss at him if he uh, let her walk home alone. And it was three houses away. So that was kind of the theme for us. Just be with your sister and be together, you know. Were you in How long were you um, um, just shy of 10 years, um, but dating and all, I think we were together 11, 11 or so, 12 years. You know the defendant in this case? Yes, sir. Uh, I was married to her for four or five years, whatever it was. When did you meet her? I met her, uh, I think somewhere along the way playing softball on the, one of the various teams we uh, played on, uh, but I didn't really get to know her until, um, beginning of 2014, so January time frame. January, you said? January of 2014 is when I started to, when I like met her and went out there and started to get to know her. This is um, not intended to embarrass anybody, but were you still married to Wayne? Yes, sir, we were separated and, uh, you know, with the intent of getting divorced, going our separate <laughs> ways, and, and that's when I met and started dating Tisha. Did the defendant have her own? She did. Harley. You move in that binder to people's exhibit number three. Is that a picture of Harley? Sure is. Yes, sir. When was that photo taken? Um. The father Looks of like, Little Gannon there testifying. We do have to squeeze in a break. We're going to hit the pause button, get you right back into the courtroom. It looks a little different. The court is only allowing a WebEx streaming type view of this trial, but such heartbreaking testimony already in this case. Don't go anywhere. A dispute between neighbors turns deadly. Now a TikTok star finds himself on trial. And Court TV will bring it all to you. The Nasty Neighbor Stabbing Trial, today, only on Court TV. A woman shoots an intruder, then realizes it was her estranged husband. What actually happened down in that basement? Someone they knew with Cameron Hall. All new episode tonight, 7, 6 central on Court TV. Seven.
A quiet Colorado community rocked by a tragedy. 11-year-old Gannon Stout disappeared from his home. Gannon's stepmother, Letitia Stout, is charged with his murder. Stout allegedly killed her stepson and then drove his body across the country. Now the jury will decide her fate. She has a tough road ahead. As a family searches for justice. She will pay 100% for this heinous thing she done. The stepmother murder trial. Live coverage today, only on Court TV. Court TV Live. Court is live and in session there in Colorado where we are following the stepmother murder trial. The first state witness on the stand is the father of little Gannon Stalk. His father Al testifying about how his little boy was born premature at about five to six months. He couldn't hold him for quite a while before uh, he was able in the NICU just heartbreaking testimony that we're already hearing from him. We've hit the pause button on that testimony. He was just getting into talking about meeting his new wife, not the mother of Gannon, but Letitia Stauk in 2014, six months before she killed him. Let's go in now live to that testimony. I mean, I think that would have been 2019. It looks like her high school graduation picture, if I'm not mistaken. This time move for admission of people. Okay. Exhibit three will be admitted. Yes, sir. Where was that? From? It, I believe it was in Columbia, South Carolina, where uh, the graduation was. Somewhere in South Carolina. Because she would go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say she was she finished her high school at an online school that was based in South Carolina. So she went back for the graduation. When you began your relationship with the South it was, yes, sir. Murder Beach. When did you end up with that? Uh, January 2015. Yes, sir. You identify her and point to where she's sitting and describe what she's wearing? T-shirt right there with the... Uh, Got a green jacket on, bluish green jacket, black. The record will so reflect. Go ahead. What do you do for work, Al? Uh, I'm an officer in the Colorado National Guard in a full time status. So let's talk a little bit about the Guard is typically. Typically, yeah, one weekend a month and then a summer duty. You said that you're I am. Uh, so I am in a, it's called AGR, and that's what I've been my whole career. Uh, even in starting in South Carolina, I was, uh, it's active guard is what it is. Um, was there for a rough 12 years or so um, as a recruiter and in, in other capacities. And then I took my commission as an officer and moved states. Um, I didn't necessarily get transferred, but I moved states to Alaska. Uh, as an officer, and then spent two about two years there, and then been in Colorado since 2019 as an officer in the Colorado Guard. So, uh, my my main duties are as, right now as a missile defense officer. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, family history. You said you got married in January 2015. Sir, was that in South Carolina? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I went to, I got hired and went there, I reported in June. Um, I had to come through here for some schooling. We call it TDY and route, but uh, I got hired, went to school here, and then drove up to Alaska to be permanently stationed. June? Uh, 2017. Uh, somewhat, it was... When I when I initially drove there, I had my two children with me, um, Lena and Gannon, and we made that trip and uh, one of the most memorable trips of my life. Um, and then Tisha and Harley came along the way a little bit later, but they they never really permanently moved there. They came for a couple weeks at a time and and, and then came and left and did whatever else. Just a little bit. And what was the custody? Uh, initially, 
well, I'll, I'll talk about during our separation. They they both stayed. The kids stayed in the house, and me and Landon alternated time in the house, so the kids could be as stable as possible during that um, tough time. Initially, the custody status Landon had the majority time, um, but we were both in the same local area, so you know we did the best we could at um, sharing that time. But I think she moved in initially with her mom, and the kids stayed there with her, and that was the initial agreement. When you said she, just so the record is clear, you're talking about Landon. Landon, I'm sorry. Yes, Landon specifically had the custody arrangement. At some point, uh, custody. Uh, yes, that would have been in March of 2018 while I was in Alaska. You mentioned just a moment ago, uh, I mean, too, so I think. Yes, sir. So did you have custody of them before you actually got transferred to Alaska? No, because that was 2017 when I took that trip initially. Um, and then they were still with their mom, um, Landon, with the majority time, uh, custody time. They What they did was they spent the summer with me in Alaska, and then I flew them back home or back to their mother for the start of the next school year. What did you move to Colorado? Uh, I moved to me individually, I can I think I got boots on ground February 15th of 2019, I believe is the date I got here. And like I said, Tisha and the kids were here beginning of January, getting a house set and everything. The defendant, yeah. You may. show you what's been marked as people's exhibit number four. Do you recognize this? Yes, that looks like a map of uh, Lorison Ranch neighborhood. <clears throat> does it have a, a specific address notated on that map? It does. What's that address? Uh, that would have been our house at 6627 Mandon Drive. Is that a Colorado Springs address? It is. Is that in El Paso County, Colorado? It is. You're going to move for admission of people's exhibit number four. Mr. Tolini, number, exhibit number four will be admitted. Go ahead. <clears throat> Can you point out the label where the 6627 Mandan Drive address is? Right here. Is that where you lived when you moved to Colorado from Alaska? Yeah, I um, I think it, just to be clear, initially, I think they had a, a little temporary housing on base, as you do when you PCS. Um, and then Tisha, or the defendant, found um, that house for rent, and we moved in. Um, and I think they were already in the house when I got here. When did, when did you all move into that house? I don't remember the sp specific date. I know they were already in the house by the time I got here in the middle of February. Okay. So February 2019, when you came from Alaska to here, you went to that? I went directly to the house from the airport. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> Mr. this already, but is that address in El Paso County, Colorado? Yes, sir. How long did you all live in that house? Um, I lived there, I guess, right out a year because when everything happened with Gannon in January of 2020, uh, you know, the investigation started taking place and we pretty much decided just to move out. And the landlord allowed us to break the lease at that point. And then, uh, so it would have been early February of 2020 when we moved out officially. So let's just go through just a general description of that house. Was it a two story, a rancher, a rancher with a basement? I, I'm not too savvy on specific style of houses, but it had a main floor and a basement. Was the basement finished? It was. Was there also an unfinished area? Um, I mean, in the closet was unfinished, but all the areas we frequented in the house were finished. What about where the furniture room was? Yeah, when I said closet, that's uh, that's what I was referring to, the furnace room, yes. <coughs> I call it, yeah, because we kept the luggage and boxes and stuff in there. And there was another unfinished closet under the stairs as well. I'm sure we'll see that as well. Where was the bedroom that you ended 
Uh, in on the on the main floor. And then was there a, a level above that? Negative. Okay, so it's just the main floor and then a basement. Then a basement, yes, sir. Who else had a bedroom? Uh, initially, it was Gannon. We do have um, to hit a break here. We are going to get you back inside of the courtroom there in Colorado, where we are allowed to look at this streaming that the court is put in, has put in place rather to watch this trial. We don't have our typical court TV cameras there, but we will get you back inside of that courtroom in the case of the stepmother murder trial when we come back. It's a mystery that's captivated the nation. This stretch is just so beyond what anyone could imagine. And left a trail of dead bodies. Lori Vallow Daybell, accused of triple murder, including her two youngest children. You'll hear every dramatic moment with real-time expert analysis. It's just so hard to know where the truth ends. The Doomsday Cult Mom Murder Trial. Coverage begins this week after jury selection, only on Court TV. TV Live, we are following in Colorado the stepmother murder trial in the case of Letitia Stauk, who's accused of killing her 11 year old stepson, Gannon Stauk. On the stand right now, Gannon's father, Al Stauk, who got married to the defendant in 2015 and then got custody of his children from his ex wife in 2018. This little boy died in 2020. Now we're going back into court live. Keep in mind, this is a WebEx type camera situation that's controlled by the court. So you're not seeing Al Stout, the father's face, but you can hear his voice as he describes what this has been like and what led up to the death of his son. 15. So coming down the stairs to the right, this is what you would have seen the little, uh, I call it the downstairs living room. So TV, sofa, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. My bike and then the dog's kennel was over here. And then, it's, you know, mementos, you can see college degrees and pictures of the family and stuff. Was it typical that you all would spend time as a family in this room? Yeah, I mean, I, I watched a lot of movies with the kids down there, but um, we did upstairs as well. So would the kids spend time on their own down there? Oh, yeah, a lot. Because again, uh, the, you can see his uh, Nintendo Switch right here. as That was his pride and joy. And uh, we also had a PlayStation and they would watch movies. And so all the gaming and stuff typically took place downstairs just to the right of that photo uh was there a hallway that went back to that back bedroom yeah it's hard can, to see you can kind of see a little uh crease right here that's the corner and it goes into uh harley's room and then her bathroom area and there's another closet right there but. okay and then people's exhibit 16. yeah so this would have been the couch we just saw um in the other picture and then this is just the back corner um, I guess it would have been what the northwest corner of the basement. I don't know, but um, but yeah. And then you sort of uh, started to point at it there, but there's a blackish square there in the center of that carpet. Yes, sir. Uh, just backing up a little bit. Uh, in January of 2020, um, specifically January 25th and 26th, uh, which would have been a Saturday and Sunday, were you at home on the on that weekend? No, I actually. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain my duty schedule, but every other week I work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and that week I actually have the work day shift on a Friday and Saturday, and then I left town on Sunday. So I was at work all day Saturday, came home, uh, the defendant and my mom was in town, and the defendant and the, I and my mom and the kids ate dinner, and then uh, my mom was leaving that night, so I took her to the airport in Denver um for her flight, and then I stayed in the airport. I slept across from the ticket counter on the floor there. And then uh, I because I had an early morning flight to go to Oklahoma for training for two weeks. So, so when did you actually um, drive up to Denver? And I'm assuming you mean uh, DIA Denver Airport. Yeah, DIA. Uh, so, I mean, I get off. I don't think I got off early that evening. I, I usually get off at 1800 or at 6 p.m. And uh, <laughs> it was 15 minute drive home or so. Um, we ate dinner and then I, no later than eight o'clock, I would assume. I, I don't remember exactly what time mom's flight left DIA, but. So you drive mom up to the airport and then you just stayed at the airport because you had a flight the next day? I had an early morning flight to uh, uh, through Dallas, I think to Lawton, Oklahoma. 
Uh, but yeah, I did. I just slept on my duffel bag or whatever right there. There's a little seating area right across from the American Airlines ticket counter at DIA. And I just laid down on the floor right there. So when you left on Saturday evening, whatever time it was, who was left at the Mandan Drive residence? Uh, the defendant and then uh, Harley and Lena and Gannon. Any other adults there? Not that I know of. No how, old was, how old was Harley at that time? She would have been, let's see, 5102. And that was, so she was uh, 17. How old was, 18. Uh, how old was Gannon? 11. And Lena? Uh, Lena was, uh, well, her birthday's in January. So, sorry, I'm doing math here. So eight, she had just turned eight. Okay. You're doing math better than I could if right. I was sitting on the stand, so thank you. So, um, when you left the house on that Saturday evening to drive mom and yourself up to the DIA, was that carpet like that when you left? It was not, no, sir. Um, did you talk to the defendant about that? I, th I believe she... I, I, well, first, did, did you talk to her about it? I did talk to her. She said there was a, an accident and a candle spill. Okay. I, I don't know if it was... Uh, let me clarify. I don't remember if it was over a text or over a phone call, but there was a conversation about it at some okay. point. Do you remember when you learned about a uh, candle spill and a burn or whatever? I... Confident that it was that Sunday night, which would have been the 26th. Okay. Either that or the next morning in okay. the text messages. And is that what we're looking at there is sort of uh, a cutout area of that carpet as a result of whatever burn happened? Yeah, what, what I was told was, yeah, there was a spill here, but you can also see that she claimed there was, some, the defendant claimed there's supposedly some candles spilled on the couch as well. You can see those little spots there. That's what she claimed that was. Did she ever say who cut that square out like that? I, th when I got home, I think there was something over it. So I don't, I don't know if she ever, the defendant ever told me that she had cut anything out. I, I cannot remember specifically on that. Okay, let's move on to People's Exhibit Seventeen. What are we looking at here? So basically, you're kind of standing by the TV almost now, and then you're looking back to where we came down the stairs. <clears throat> and this would have been that entryway into Harley's area. Once again, the dog kennel, we referenced that in the computer area. And this is what I call it a closet. I, I forget how you referenced it, but the boiler room or whatever. I call it a storage room. But storage room, okay. Uh, unfinished area where okay. furnace and that kind of thing? Yes, sir. Okay. And then where's Gannon's room in relation to that? So you'd have this behind this wall. You just, there's a little small little uh, hallway. As soon as you get here, you take a right and it leads into his bedroom. Okay. People's Exhibit 18. Is that just a sh uh, closer up view of into that storage room? Yeah, now we're walking towards the storage room here, and then you can see this little, you know, gap here. That's how you get into Gannon's room. People's 21. So, Judge, we'll have to turn the screen off for just a moment. Okay, we're ready. Hold on. We do have to step aside for a break, but you're seeing right there the testimony from the victim's father in this case, Al Stow, talking about the bedroom, the house that they lived in all together, the defendant, the children, the father, and the bedroom where this little boy was killed and prosecutors say attacked mercilessly. We'll get you back into that courtroom where we left off. We're going to hit the pause button on the other side. Quiet Colorado community rocked by a tragedy. 11 year old Gannon Stout disappeared from his home. Gannon's stepmother, Letitia Stout, is charged with his murder. Stout allegedly killed her stepson and then drove his body across the country. Now, the jury will decide her fate. She has a tough road ahead. As a family searches for justice, she will pay 100% for this heinous thing she done. The stepmother murder trial. Live coverage today, only on Court TV. It's an alone. Let's get you back to Colorado and the stepmother murder trial. The state has called its first witness in the case against Letitia Stout. Gannon's father, Al Stout, we're hearing from him. Remember, the prosecutor said during opening statement, this case is about insanity and that evidence will show that Stout knew right from wrong. The defense, though, claims that Stout dealt with lifelong trauma. She was abused as a child and claims that she was killing her demons when Gannon died. Let's go back into court now. 
again, having something happen to him. Uh, you mentioned hearing something from the defendant about the burn downstairs. Was there a point in time when you learned that he was missing? Yes, I was in Oklahoma. We had had our first day of class. Like I said, I was scheduled to be there two weeks. I just got out of our first day of class. I went and ran um, a couple miles, whatever it was. And then uh, I was already back in my hotel room uh, preparing for the next day and, uh, and whatever. And then we started the conversation back and forth about he's not home yet. We had specific times for them to be home. Um, typically, it was the street lights. It's something I used to do as a kid. I had to be home by the street lights. So we just implemented that. And he hadn't come home in time. And uh, it was abnormal, but it wasn't worrisome. So um, I don't know how much you want me to go into that. Yeah, so I'm going to ask you some follow-up questions okay. about that. When you say that he hadn't come home yet, did you know that he hadn't come home, or is this what the defendant was telling you? Yeah, based on the conversation that me and the defendant were having, of course, I was in Oklahoma, so I had no clue. I'm just relying on trusting her that um, he hadn't come back from his friend's house yet, which is where she said he had been. And what day was that that you heard this information? This would have been the Monday, so that I believe it was the 27th. 27th. Yeah. Do you know if he went to school on the 27th? According to her, he did not. Her being? Excuse me, the defendant. According to the defendant, he did not because he was having stomach issues and he was sick, which in my mind at that time is like, why is he going to his friend's house if he's that sick? So it was a little confusing, but. Would it, uh, would it be typical if he was having uh, digestive issues to stay home from school? No, sir. Okay. So that by itself was out of the ordinary. Right. And when did you find out that he was going to stay home from school? I believe, uh, without having timestamps, I believe it was that morning, and I think she sent me some photos okay. saying, you know, Gannon's home, here he is, or whatever. Yep. And then when you found out from the defendant that he had potentially gone to a friend's house and hadn't come home, do you know what time that was? I mean, I, I don't know specifically without looking when that conversation started, but it was it was, it was already in the evening where I was when... when um, we started that conversation. So you learn in the morning that Gannon doesn't go to school from the defendant mm -hmm. because of stomach issues. And then sometime in the evening, you learn that he had gone to a friend's house and had not come had home. Had not come home. And that all comes from the defendant. Yes, sir. When did you get back to Colorado? I, um, I came as soon as I can after the, I decided basically that there was something actually wrong. Uh, so the 27th, as soon as I decided he's missing, I got to come home. I had, all, I, not to get ahead, but I know, I think the defendant had called 911. I don't know about the, when the police came to the house, but I know I also called them and said, hey, what's going on? My son's out there somewhere. And at that point, I called our travel people and said, hey, I need an emergency ticket home. And I left. I had a buddy drive me to actually to Oklahoma City, and I left from Oklahoma City Airport early the next morning. So let's unpack that just a little bit. Sure. So <clears throat> to your memory, the defendant tells you that she called 911? She did. Was it that specifically or was it an accumulation of things that made you worried and decide to that you need to get back home and see what's going on? Yeah. So and like I said, I didn't know how deep you wanted me to go at that point. I, I had also contacted numerous of Gannon's friends, parents in the neighborhood that I knew, um, you know, he would typically frequent their house and, and play with their kids and stuff, and none of them had even seen him. So then it, it started to become an issue. Uh, there was also a, another claim about some new friend on the school bus and, and some other stuff surrounding that I'm sure we'll get into. Um, do you want me to go into nope, that? Okay. Right All right. All um, right. There, there was that, and so I asked, started asking the parents about, do you know any, do you know this person's name, or do you know anything about another person? And it, so it became, it started compounding, as you said, to become more worrisome. So basically, you're accumulating information and, and growing more worried. Is that what you're describing? Yes, sir. And then when you said you called your travel people, do you mean you called the National Guard folks? Well, we have like a central billing travel type agency that does all of our flights and stuff like that. So I just called them. I think it's called Sado. I don't remember exactly, but I called them um, on my orders. It has the emergency number. So I just called that, say, hey, I got to go home. This is happening. Okay. Um, I also called Landon and some of her family as well to try to notify them, hey, I'm going home. Something's wrong. When did you actually then fly out of, I think you said Oklahoma City? Uh, yeah. So one of my uh, 
battle buddies or whatever. One of my guys in my class took me up to Oklahoma City because that was the only flight they could find um, or the soonest flight they could find. And um, it, early the next morning, I spent the night sitting in the, at, once again right across from the ticket counter at Oklahoma City. I don't remember the flight.